early steps in this whole process, probably one of the first things that we did to begin to um, move our animals, get more adoptions, the whole notion was we had to get as many sterile animals into the community as possible, like mosquito control. And basically, as we know, uh, people um, don't make a choice to get a cat. A cat's in front of them and they own a cat. And that's how 67% of the people who own cats own cats because their cat was there. So if we're not putting cats in front of people and just waiting for them to come to our shelters, we're going to euthanize cats forever. We need to put our cats everywhere. When we started our first uh, off-site adoption program, I actually reported on it here at the first or second Animal Care Expo. And I was practically booed off the stage. People thought that was just a terrible idea that I was putting cats in retail places. And uh, now we have, uh, the SPCA alone has 22 off-site locations. We needed good data to benchmark our progress. It's really hard to keep going if you can't see you know, the, the, what you're doing. And I'll tell you, when you're in the trenches and you're doing the work, it's hard to see if there's any improvement unless there's somebody keeping score for you. So when I go to my veterinary technicians or my adoption staff or what have you and I share the data with them, you know, you can just see their faces light up. So if you're not keeping good data, it's really, really important to do that to be able to say, wow, look at the progress we've made. Or uh, we're not making progress and the data can maybe tell you why. You need to make sure that you're sterilizing all the cats and dogs leaving your facility. I hope you all have access to that. Uh, we've been really fortunate in Buffalo. We've had early age sterilization since 1987 in, at some level and since 1995 for all shelter animals in the whole county. Being honest with the public. I can remember when I first uh, went to um, the Erie County SPCA and we had a public relations person there and I heard a news reporter ask her something about euthanasia. She changed the subject. She didn't tell the truth. I, I can't remember exactly what she did. But after he left, I went into her office. I said, what was that about? And uh, she said, well, I was told by the previous administrator, you know, you don't want to talk about euthanasia and you, you just pretend it doesn't happen. I was like, excuse me, but how exactly is the public supposed to help you if they don't know you have a problem? So from this point on, we will be honest. Every time anybody answer, asks us a question, we want them to know what we're doing because we want them to be as upset about it as we are, right? And we want their help. And I'll tell you, I've never gotten to any trouble being honest, ever. So I, I think that's really important to where we've gotten. And realizing the most important partner is your public. I, I think we still have way too many organizations who are saying we can't trust the public, we don't want them to have our animals, they're lousy, you know, all that kind of stuff. Well, yeah, there are a few of those folks. And it's hard to see when you have intake all the time from people who are um, surrendering their animals that there's a whole world of wonderful people out there, just wonderful people waiting to help you. And so um, make sure you remember what an important partner they are. So <clears throat> I've already said all this. Uh, by you know, adopting the cats all over the county that are sterilized instead of just close to our shelter, we really began to see the numbers come down, which really helps us out a lot. Um, we have 22 uh, off-site programs, and we're adopting about 1,500 uh, cats alone at one location at a local mall. And a quarter of all the adoptions at the SPCA occur off-site in one way or another. So this cat is going to tell us a little bit about data. It's critical, as I said, for your benchmarking. You have to make sure that, uh, and, and if you're looking to get a Maddie's grant, I'll tell you, uh, if you don't have your data, you're not going to get the grant because uh, they really want to be able to measure as well. And we were really fortunate that we had pretty good data, uh, our shelter did, and we had to bring some of the other organizations along as we went for the Maddie's grant. But having 
our piece in order really help the other organizations get their piece in order, um, you know, in your community collaboration. So it, um, and it doesn't just help you with the Maddie's grant, but it helps you with um, all kinds of uh, grants to be able to specifically say, this is where we are, I'm looking for money from you, and this is what I predict will happen if you give me the money. And, and we all do need the money, right? Um, the more that people hear about your organization, the more adoptions, donations, volunteers, friends, credibility you're going to have. And it has to be ongoing. You know, it can't, um, I'm really, really fortunate that I have a wonderful PR person, uh, same person that was there when I came. Uh, and um, she's got us on every network television station. I think we're also on Fox. We're on five radio stations a week. And the media loves stories about animals. And if you can provide them consistent, honest um, information about the animals in your care, and it doesn't have to be just the nasty cruelty case. They want the happy stories as well. Uh, you're going to find that takes you a long way in getting your name out there and making sure that the public is right in step with what you're doing. You know, we all started with the pet of the week in the paper. I don't even know if there's any place that has pet of the week in the paper anymore since everything is online and using the internet and all that sort of stuff. But um, you certainly want to uh, use the internet. And, you know, as many of the local papers as you can get, if you have a, an advertiser or a bee or anything, uh, get those animals into uh, the public's eye. And all these things that I'm suggesting that you do are the things that are going to help you get to the point where you're going to be able to um, look at your treatable animals, not just your healthy animals. And it certainly takes lots of money to uh, make progress. Um, I, I think that uh, boards of directors of shelters heavily rely on their executive directors to do everything. And um, you can tell them that I said, you need a development department, OK? And development departments will pay for themselves. It's really, really important to have somebody really concentrating and getting out there and getting the funds that you need to do your work. It's not, um, it's not really acceptable to expect the executive director to be the fundraiser, uh, the, um, humane educator, the uh, cruelty investigator, and the kennel cleaner. You know, it, it, you really need to find professionals and find ways for your board to make sure that these positions are funded, and it's really going to help you in the long run, run to have um, uh, really a good development staff. Our public support with our development staff and our ability to tell the community, this is what we're doing, this is the progress we've made. Uh, we, we've gone from being able to raise in donations 1 million to 3.5 million in, in 10 years, which I think is pretty incredible in the second poorest city in the country. Um, so again, public relations, honesty, and showing life-saving results is what really is going to bring you the support that you need. Uh, I think everybody has talked about how important volunteers are. We utilize volunteers, I think, every place in the shelter. And we have about 12 volunteers per staff member. So we are over 12,000 volunteers at this point who are doing just everything. I mean, they're working in the surgeries, they're fostering in their homes, they're um, helping file in the office, they are uh, attending our fundraising events, they're doing everything that our staff does without making the staff nervous about their jobs. I mean, it's really fabulous. And it's, and it's a good thing to be able to tell your donors that when you give me a dollar, I turn it into 12 because we're supporting every staff member with 12 volunteers. And those volunteers, they have more credibility than you do. You're a paid staff member. The volunteers, when they go out and they tell the community great things are happening at the SPCA, people really listen to them. They really hear it, you know. So you have wonderful ambassadors, and they protect your bottom line. Also, volunteer coordination is also not an add-on job. Uh, tell your boards you need a volunteer coordinator. 
Um, so many agencies that I've visited uh, around the country, you know, they'll say, well, we need volunteers, and they bring the volunteers, and then they have nothing for the volunteer to do because there's no program, no one to support that program, and they lose the volunteer. And then people say out in the community, well, I went to volunteer there, and they, you know, they're always complaining they don't have this and that, but they had nothing for me to do. So volunteer coordination, the whole volunteer program is, you know, if you look at it like a clock, you don't add volunteers till it's about six or seven o'clock. There's a lot of work to do before you add your volunteers to your program. So all, all these things lead to the other. So all the things we've talked about really develop your supportive community. They add on to your adoptions. They diminish your euthanasia. They help develop your great reputation. They give you more financial support. Certainly, too, all these things add to having a happier staff. We all want to keep our staff. It takes a long time to train them, get them uh, really, really good. And you don't want to lose them because they're not happy with the jobs. We, we want happy folks. Uh, you get volunteers lead to more volunteers. And all that leads to growth and the ability to do, to do more in your community. We do a ton more than surrenders and adoptions. We have all kinds of programs. And I was um, talking at dinner last night with our co-presenters about what I see as our future because I know we're going to end, we're all going to end the overpopulation pro problem in this country and we'll still all have these organizations. And what, what are our plans for the future? What are we going to do? Some of the plans on the books for us are uh, wildlife protection. I think there's two other SPCAs in the country that have a wildlife program. We've had ours for 10 years. I know that's the up-and-coming problem, and we, we want to be ready to be not reactive but proactive in that area. I think we spent the entire 1900s being reactive to dog and cat problems, and that's why we had cities like Chicago that were getting 42,000 homeless animals in at one time because we were so busy reacting that we could never be proactive. And so I think that for this century, it's up to all of us to look to the future and be proactive and know what's coming down the pike and get ready for it. And all that, all those other things allow you the freedom to dream and look at what the issues are gonna be out in the future.